I want to talk a little bit about this. So, you know, Group Sex, you recorded it in July 1980, which wasn't that long after you formed. Uh, the album has 14 songs in 15 minutes and 25 seconds. That became like a landmark thing for a lot of punk rock re- records, you know, and bands. They were starting to, how many songs can we cram in here? But, you know, right. in, the sh- in, in the shortest amount of time. And I looked for a little bit on producer Carrie Markoff, but I couldn't find really. Was that just a friend or how, how did that come about? He was the guy that fronted the weed to the stu- the guy that ran the studio <laughs> at, after hours for the studio time, literally, you know, you know. <laughs> so he, he was a friend of Lucky's and he, you know, he dabbled in a little, uh, you know, a side hustle, let's call it. And he traded some weed to the engineer because back back in those days, uh, studios were 24 hours a day. They ran 24 hours a day. And the uh, the the newer engineers, the second engineers would get to bring their their bands in late at night. So we would get a call like the session would be over at 11 p.m. Come on in. We got studio time. And we were doing it on the sly because he didn't tell anybody it was because we were just, it was a bro deal. We, the studio wasn't making money. Yeah. So we had to sneak in when the studio manager wasn't around or the owner or the, the, the main engineers were, were gone for the day and go and sneak in and get our recording in. And now, did you do this to half inch tape or do you recall how it was recorded? What kind of gear? It was 16 track, yeah. 16 track, okay. And you get in there. And it sounds like you were recorded live off the floor, but maybe guitars were overdubbed or, or, or vocals. That's exactly, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Okay, okay. And and I know on the song Group Sex, it's we didn't do any overdubs except for some vocals. Mm-hmm. It's crazy how much happened in production and styling from 80 to 90. Okay, and and the the sounds of the records and the stuff you were doing with Bad Religion a decade later, because I remember as a kid getting into punk rock and this was only the late 80s. I had heard you by 88, 89, but the record sounded old to me as a kid being from 80 and only a seven year span. That's how much technology had 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 surpassed all of us at that point. But now in a weird way. This sounds fresh 43 years later, if that makes sense. <laughs> it doesn't it's, sound like everything else out there now. Right. We were probably thinking the same thing about the bands from the 60s. It's like, oh, that stuff sounds so dead. Uh-huh. And it's like, this sounds so much better, you know. <laughs> right, right. And then you go back, you know, 10 years after that or 20 years, 30 years, whatever years. Like, that still sounds. It's like I heard the other day I'm at in, in the store somewhere and I hear, uh, Sad. It was actually yesterday. I was going to get Diet Coke somewhere at a liquor store, and I hear Satisfaction, and it's like this still fucking rocks. Rolling Stones, <laughs> like, you know, a thousand years later, it it still stands up. Some stuff still does. Some stuff stands up. Some stuff does not. You know. Yeah. And, and and real quick, before we jump in the track, I just want to touch on uh, Penelope Spheris. Uh, she was the director in The Decline of Western Civilization, a 1980 documentary about punk rock, which she followed up with an excellent uh, part two of The Metal Years. And both movies are, are, are some of my favorite documentations of history from that part. And your performance in it is just so great. I sat there and watched the whole thing. It's like four songs. It's on YouTube. Uh, for, for those listening, go check it out. But it's just, you know... Uh, you did this record. You did group sex. How long after that were you playing shows? Were you playing shows before the record was recorded? And and how did you get momentum? You guys were basically starting over from Black Flag and Red Cross. How did you get noticed early on? Uh, we, uh, yeah, we just, we played parties. We played every weekend, anywhere we could, you know, at colleges, uh, whatever. And we just went out there and, and we're just kind of working the songs in mm-hmm. when, as we go. I remember our first show. I think we fucked up every song. But, <laughs> but we barreled through them all. and like, okay, hmm, that was kind of a train wreck. But people seem to like it anyway. Yeah. I don't know. We might be. Maybe we're, we're not. We weren't as bad as we thought, you know. But we all do you remember? Do you this remember night. that feeling of exhilaration from those first shows? I mean, I still am amped before I play and when I get off stage, but nothing can ever take the place yeah. of that. It, it's kind of like, you know, the, the, you know, here's your first hit, kid. It's like nothing, mm-hmm. <laughs> nothing, nothing gets better than that first time. For sure. 
Yeah, it's it, it's. But it's also I, terrifying. I, I, I mean, we, <laughs> me and our bass player Xander, we joke around because you know I always get a little little nervous before that, or psych pumped up before we play, and it's like, are you, we always like joke? Are you nervous? Yep. But I'm terrified? Yep. Terrified. Yep. This is happening. There's no take backs. You know, <laughs> we just got to go do it. <laughs> 